Hello everybody, Terak37 here, and welcome to yet another weird experiment. I mean, I say experiment, but let's be honest, a lot of other people have done this um, on YouTube, but, you know, maybe I can bring something new to it, and if not, this is honestly more for me to, like, see if I can actually get a freaking solo campaign done. Um, yeah, this is basically set up for a... Star Wars RPG uh, solo campaign. Um, not Han Solo. Um, essentially, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be playing a pen and paper RPG by myself. Um, there will be no other players. Uh, it'll be me being the player. And the GM will be run by Mythic uh, GM Emulator 2nd Edition. I have this neat little... Um, very neat little um, module that lets me basically just kind of start off this way. Um, so, uh, what you're seeing right now is the screen that I'm showing is Foundry Virtual Tabletop, as you can probably see in the upper left hand corner. Um, what Foundry is, is it's a virtual tabletop. Uh, it costs like a license, costs like $50. But once you have it, um, you can basically run run a game for yourself and your friends. And your players don't have to spend a dime. They can, you give them a link, boom, they, they log in, and you're playing. They don't need to spend a dime on this. Um, heck, one person can buy it and basically set up a game where they're not the GM and someone else is the GM. And boom, like literally only one person actually needs to buy it. Um, so, that is what you're seeing on the screen. It is very modular, lots of different systems, some official, some made by fans who just really needed the system to exist. Um, and the system we are using for uh, this is Star Wars Fantasy Flight Games, which I believe is like the third Star Wars um, RPG. So, um, kind of the basics of this system, I'll get more into it when we are actually start rolling dice and everything. Um, it is a dice pool system. You have positive dice. As you can see here, these are, uh, they start with a baseline of, you have green eight-sided dice. Uh, determined, the number you roll is determined by these numbers. So, willpower is four, so you'd be rolling four green dice. Um, uh, and then a uh, rank in a skill upgrades it. So it turns a green D8 positive die into a yellow D12 positive die, which has a chance for a special symbol called the triumph, which essentially is a crit. Um, it works. Crits work a bit differently in this system. Again, we'll get into that later. Um, so the way that this works is, let me just give you a brief example. Uh, two purple dice, I will upgrade the difficulty. Boosts are uh, basically like conditional things of, oh, ha your weapon is it has an accuracy rating, or um, a circumstance has made it easier for this to happen. Um, setbacks are basically the opposite. Every die has an opposite other than the force die. Um, and then a roll. And boom, two successes. Most symbols pretty much cancel each other out one to one. Um, you can succeed and have something bad happen. You can succeed and have something good happen. It's a uh, it's a very narrative system. Uh, it's, beyond success and failures, you have symbols called advantage and threat that cancel each other out. And if there's anything remaining. Uh, you can use that, you can either do a mechanical benefit, or you can do something narratively. Um, that is one of the reasons I like this game so much, is that it's not just pass-fail. Uh, built into it is a pass with a complication or a, um, well, with an advantage. Um... This is also, this is not a game where I level up, like you 
you know, you reach an XP threshold or you reach a point in the story and you get like and you level up. This is an XP based system. So basically at the end of every session I will give myself uh, they recommend in the core book like 10 XP. Um, and I can use that to upgrade my skills. I can use that to get talents. Um, I can use that to get force powers. Um, force, again, we'll get into that later. Um, I'm trying to keep this as uh, um, loose as possible so that I don't ramble too much. So, um, here is, uh, I'm going to do a bit of setup so that you can kind of see what we're working with. So, uh, there is a destiny pool. Light side points are spent by the players to make things easier on themselves, like giving themselves an upgrade to their check or downgrading the difficulty, making it easier. Or they can use a light side point to add a fact, basically be like, oh, retroactively, we oh, this planet turns out not to have a breathable atmosphere. Good thing I remembered to buy a spacesuit or an environmental suit. You can spend a light side point, spend the credits, and boom, you can retroactively say, okay, I got it. Dark side points can be used by the GM to basically do the exact same thing. Uh, I will roll for the Destiny pool for the first session. Ooh, that's lucky. I'll roll four times because I like having it roll four times. Uh, everyone will roll, every player rolls a Force die, even if they're not a Force user, at the start to generate the Destiny pool. Um... So the force die is a d12, with I believe it's seven of the sides generate a dark side point, five of the sides generate a light side point, but there's it varies between one and two. Uh, I'm explaining this because I love this about this about this particular die. It's my favorite of the dice because of this. Um, you have a greater chance of rolling dark side points, but if you roll light side, you have a greater chance of rolling two light side instead of only one. Um, so this goes into, you know, in Empire Strikes Back, Yoda says uh, the dark side is not stronger. It's quicker, it's easier, it's more seductive, but it's not actually stronger than the light side. And that's represented beautifully by the dice. Um, let's see. Um, if you're wondering how Mythic GM Emulator works, uh, essentially, there's two main things of fate question, where essentially I ask, hey, um, I ask a yes or no question, determine the uh, likelihood of it being a yes, and then I ask a question, a D100 is rolled, and depending on the chaos factor here, which always starts at five for your first, when you're first starting out, um, and the likelihood that you chose, it can be anything from 50-50 up to certain down to impossible. Um, so, for example, my character, Boatu Dreth, a hut, has an ancient sword. So, I'm going to ask a question. Unsure is, means 50-50. Um, the question is, is this ancient sword a family heirloom. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave it at 50-50. Whatever happens, this will be the result that we'll go with. Um, is this ancient sword a family heirloom? Yes, it is a family heirloom. So, he got this ancient sword basically by stealing it from his family. Um, so, uh, I could make a note on that ancient sword. Or somewhere in my character sheet. And say, his ancient sword is a family heirloom. Now, if I were to have rolled a doubles, and that would have been under the chaos factor, then that would have meant that this that a random event would happen. However, we haven't even started yet. 
Um, I've already decided on a starting planet. He is on Nar Shada, the moon of Nalhada. I'm going to do my best not to go into a nerd rant on every little thing. Um, if you've played Star Wars The Old Republic, the MMO, um, odd, I think every faction at some point during their main storyline has to go to Nar Shada for some reason. Um, if you played as a bounty hunter or an Imperial agent, then your starting quest was on Nalhutta. Um, like, your, your starting, like, arc. So, I know he's on Nar Shada. Uh, as you can probably see there, I have a map. I did make this map. This is the only map that I've made. None of the, pretty much none of the art assets I have, I made. I want to be clear about that. I a lot of these I got a while ago. I don't remember where, but I will tell you right now, I did not make any of the art. The only thing I will make sometimes are maps, and I'll try to point those out. Assume everything I got off of Pinterest, because um, that's usually where I go if I'm basically just like looking for, um, like for example, this hut guy who, look at that face, he's... Yeah. Yeah, it's not great. Um, but um, there are many ways to start an actual session. Uh, I'm going to roll for a random event. And that random event is going to determine, um, essentially, uh, what's happening on Nar Shaddaa. How How do we start? Because uh, one thing that I've heard from pretty much everybody, uh, like uh, me, myself, and Dai, um, and like I look on the solo role-playing uh, Reddit, um, one thing that I've noticed is everyone agrees that you should start with some kind of inciting incident. Start in the middle of the action. Don't start, you know, don't start just, like, doing something boring. Start with an action scene of some kind. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, like, violence, like a shootout, uh, but something something that's going to grab your interest and make you want to continue. So, I'm not great at this, so I'm going to just roll a random event. Uh, reason for the random event, I'm going to say, um, let's see, uh, starting scene. And then the event focus, uh, let's see here, what are our options? Uh, event focus, uh, doesn't really need to be, yeah, let's just roll, all right, starting scene. Okay, this is a remote event. I might want to re-roll that. And you are definitely free to um, abandon art. Remote event. Mm. Abandon art. It's a remote event. Ooh. Okay. I'm going to make a note of my idea. So, the idea I have is that an art gallery owned by the Dreth clan, um, or the Dreth family, has been broken into. and a number of uh, pieces of art have been stolen. Because I already, I pretty much already said um, Bois to Dreth uh, stole like the sword. Batu is accused of the thefts since he stole the sword. Since he stole the sword. So, here is essentially how I would... Do, so, what a remote event is, it is something that is not happening directly to your character, it is something that they hear about. So basically, like, oh, like, while he's, like, on Nar Shada, probably trying to, like, find a ship willing to uh, t 
take him on as a member of the crew, um, a broadcast comes on and oops, he, uh, maybe even since it says abandoned, maybe he was supposed to be in charge of the art exhibit and he is partially responsible for the, uh, theft of the art and when he, like, bolted to Nar Shada, um, thinking that he could, like, hide out there for a little while, um, without being found, uh, he stole the sword, but while he was gone, someone broke into the art gallery that he was supposed to be guarding for his family, and, oops, they took his, they took some of the art, and now he is accused of doing the entire robbery. So, boom. Uh, he's now gonna be hunted down, his face is going to be plastered all over Narshida. Uh, he's going to need to get a ticket off-world that isn't going to immediately turn him in. Um, yeah, honestly, I think this is a that's actually a pretty good start. Um, I will work on uh, setting up the map and the tokens that we'll need to worry about uh, on the next map in the next episode, and we will continue in earnest. Uh, thank you all for watching slash listening. I hope you found this entertaining, and I hope I can actually finish something for once in regards to this. I've tried a couple different times to do solo RPGs. I'm never really able to finish. I think one, I basically, it wasn't a campaign. It was basically just, like, essentially what would amount to a session. Um, so, yeah. Um... Hope I'll see you in the next one, and if not, I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.